Hi everyone, I'm Scott Schneider. This is Stereo Niche. Hey, this week, it's something a little unusual. It's the million dollar system that was just auctioned off. Stick around. All right, so this week it's a little bit of a different topic, but one I've been wanting to cover for some time, and that's custom builds. If you run across something that is a custom build, how do you price that? How do you approach it? If you're a collector and it's something of interest for you, how might you go about pricing it and real, you know, coming up with a valuation? So we have some great examples this week because the million dollar auction, the system from Ken Fritz, uh, was just auctioned off. Ken Fritz, and I, and I put the link um, in, in the description of my video, but Ken was an amazing guy. He was an audiophile extraordinaire, and he had this, the financial resources to, to build his ultimate system. And there's a great documentary out there, and that's the link I've put in the description of his system. He spent, I think it was 27 years uh, perfecting it uh, from end to end, every detail, uh, he did. He sweated out everything from the room itself. He spent quite a number of years just building the room that was going to contain the ultimate system. So he absolutely uh, didn't hold back on any aspect. And it's a great story, very very interesting. And it's one that you know, if you're at all interested in music and gear, it's a story you you definitely need to watch. So that link is there. Go check it out. So Ken uh, sadly passed away though, and. Unfortunately, his system, um, you know, was eventually sold, and it just sold in an auction, which I'm also going to put the link for you, uh, as well. And the auction just completed, so that auction gives us some insight into what what were things valued at, what were those custom builds they did uh, were nice enough to put us put in the, the the auction items, the cost of those builds, and then we can obviously see what did they end at and what they sold for. So when you're looking at a custom build, and so there's a lot of, of um, enthusiasm in the DIY arena around building your own gear. Now, the, I think the vast majority of it, and I have no statistics, but I think the vast majority around customization and, and DIY builds are mostly around speakers. So there's a, ton, there's a lot of websites that are building uh, or selling individual drivers and crossover components and cabinets and, and things like that to, to build your own uh, speakers. And it's a lot of fun. A lot, a lot of people have great enthusiasm. In fact, the video I did just last week um, that I released of, of um, Julian uh, Burke and looking at his massive collection and, and his audio, uh, while I was there visiting with him, he introduced me to a, an audiophile named Scott. And I had the pleasure and honor of seeing and hearing Scott's custom-built uh, system in his home. Now, Scott spent quite a number of years uh, building a speaker system. Uh, part of it is built into the room itself and then the individual towers uh, alongside of it. And he spent a lot of years tuning that to his heart's content. And it's incredible. Uh, I got to sit down and listen to several tracks and it's amazing. Uh, it, it would be very, very challenging to duplicate that from commercially available products that you just buy off the shelf and then you know put them in your room. What he has done and what other fellow audiophiles do in those cases that like to build their system is actually make the room accoutrements and everything part of the entire system. And he didn't do it overnight. It took him quite a lot of effort and uh, a lot of, uh, of study and, and uh, math and engineering and all of that went into his ultimate build and, you know, well, will, will he ever be completely satisfied and not want to tweak things? Probably not. It's probably, I think, in their nature to want to continue tweaking things. But what a system it is today. And there are lots of people that did that. And Ken Fritz was one of those. And so uh, a, a lot of people do it. But eventually, those things have to be sold. And they will have to be bought by someone. So collectors like me eventually will run across them. And when we do, and if we're interested in buying them, how do we price them? So that's what I really want to focus on here um, and talk about. And so when you do that, um, so if you, if you run across a speaker, let's say that's a custom build, 
The only way to go about pricing it is to take and look at the individual drivers and components that are in there and then put a price on those and add them up. That's essentially what you do. Unfortunately, you can't put in a valuation on the, the level of effort that it took, the number of hours uh, of engineering, all of that simply can't be valued. The, pro the reason is because you have no comparable out there. There's not another one out there that you can compare it to. The only exception, um, and it's a rare exception, is in something that is built as a piece of art. Now, in those cases, which I've not run across it myself, I don't think I'm in the, 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 the financial category to be able to afford those types of pieces, but I'm aware that there are some pieces that have been built as great sounding pieces, but they're also works of art. Those are a different level and a different category completely. So I'm only talking about just unique custom builds here uh, that someone wanted to put in their home for the best sonic quality, not for a piece of art. So looking, we're gonna look at Ken's finished auction items and just walk through them and talk through them a bit and see what did they cost and then what did they ultimately sell for. So starting us off, uh, Ken, Ken's primary and main speaker system, a pretty incredible set of towers or a triplet of towers here. Uh, these were around seven and a half feet tall. Uh, they're a line array. A lot of drivers, a lot of technology, a lot of effort went into building, you know, these speakers. So pretty amazing. Uh, they did list out a lot of the components that are in them. Uh, I think those are, that's the individual um, number of, of um, components there. But you could, I don't think it gave enough detail here to go through and exactly know what drivers were used. Uh, if, if I was, had, was going to be interested in them, I would have probably called them and said, can I get more detail? But that's the way you would approach it. You would say, okay, if there are this many drivers, what's the cost of those drivers individually? Multiply that by the number of drivers, you know, the crossovers, any, anything that goes along with it, and then add that up and then come up with some kind of value that if you did need to sell them one day, you could try to at least recoup some of your money. So it looks like uh, these cost around $216,000 uh, for this particular system. And I think that's, that's all three speakers. So not a sum of money most of us could afford, but regardless, that was what he put into them. In the end, the final bid, just over $10,000. So although a massive amount of money went into the, the building them and designing them, unfortunately it didn't equate into in, this, in the sale side of things. And that's okay. Ken wasn't worried about the resale value. Ken was after something else. He was after his own um, you know, sound that, uh, that was perfection to him, and that was his pursuit and only that. So it doesn't matter in the end what it sold for. This is just a conversation about, you know, if you were a collector, how you might approach things. So on that note, moving on into the next item, there was a custom turntable uh, there as well. And they listed out a lot of the components. Most of it are the arms that are there, but it looks like some soda components and some VPI um, hardware in there. And if you took your time, you could probably come up with some kind of you know, valuation for those uh, in, in, the, in the amount of, that he spent uh, having it, I guess, put together and designed. He ended up putting in around $52,000. Now, after the auction was sold and finished, it ended up selling for just under 20000 which I thought was a pretty good return uh, on that particular build. So I thought that was actually pretty high. Um, not, it, not that it was overpriced by any means, but I thought that was a pretty good for a custom-built uh, turntable. Now, Ken also had some, um, and this is probably where it becomes easier to value, he had some uh, speakers that were vintage drivers, in this case, a set of JBL speakers, Quite a cool setup here, quite unique. But they also listed out the individual drivers and you could go through and, and say, you know, how much is an LE15, a, a 375, an 075 bullet tweeter, you know, how much do those cost or how much are they bringing today? And add them up. Now they didn't give a, an estimate here, but there was probably a good amount of money that was spent on, you know, designing those cabinets and putting the bill together. But in the end, they went for $2,600. And in my back of the, pencil, uh, uh, napkin sort of uh, calc here, I think that's probably close to what the drivers would total up to. So not a bad 
uh, amount of money spent on those. And if they decided they didn't like the way they sounded, they could get their money back or put them into another build and not be out, you know, a large sum. Lots of gear were there. Uh, lots, he was, he was definitely, this system was pretty much all Krell and um, lots of, of uh, FPB 600s were there. I have a couple of them. They are absolutely the heaviest uh, things I've ever had to move. Um, not kidding when they say they're 200 pounds each. Um, these retailed for 12.5. Uh, that's not the resale value there, but that was how much they cost originally. And in the end, they ended up selling for around $3,000, in this case, 3,100. But that's the going rate. Now, in this case, they had to add on more for the selling fees, but um, that's about what they sell for. So the difference in, a, you know, trying to figure out what's, what's custom pricing versus, uh, you know, a, a commercial item that's sold uh, quite often, uh, you get a comparable and you will know about what you, you know, would want to put into it. So that's the, the advantage of having something that is, uh, there are multiples of it and there are multiple sales and you can get a, a valuation. Now, there was also some, um, some older gear. This is one of them. One of the other items was a Dynaco ST70 that I saw. And I only saw this one picture that was, you know, pretty good picture. That is about the best looking ST70 I think I've ever seen. Um, ST70s are often rebuilt, um, the originals, and they still look old, but they st they'll, they'll bring around $1,200 roughly for a refurbished one um, that still has its stings and scratches and even rust spots. This one looks darn near new. Uh, I would say this one probably go would go for close to $2,000, if not maybe even over $2,000, and it ended up selling for $800. So I think someone got an excellent deal there. Um, very nice unit and a very nice buy. So there were good, there were good buys and buys to be had uh, at this auction. Um, there were lots of individual drivers that probably went pretty well. Um, I didn't check you know, all of them out. But anyway, that's a good example of one of the good buys that were, were at the auction. There was another um, turntable example. There were several turntables. I, didn't, I just selected a couple of them. Um, this is a Denon PBN 308. Now this was a custom build. PBN Audio is a, sort of a custom designer. Um, I think they're out of Denmark, um, but they build some very high-end uh, customized gear and you can actually go out and, and find some comparables for them. Now I think each of these turntables may be slightly custom, but at least you can get some close examples. Not many, it's, they're still quite rare, but this retailed originally for around 30,000. And in the end, it, uh, Let's see, ended up selling for around over 10,000. So pretty good, uh, pretty good price. Uh, I don't know, you know, again, this was a, as a very rare item, but that sounds like a, a pretty good price, you know, for this particular unit. Um, at least though, you can go out to the company and ask them even PBN and say, hey, listen, you have any, you know, have any recent sales to get, a, you know, somewhat of approximate, you know, valuation. It's gonna be in their interest, of course, to go as high as they can, but, um, you know, 10, 10, 750 for a unit that originally cost 30 K and maybe that was just a few years ago. I don't know when these were sold, but anyway, that's what this one brought. And now there is a comparable out there. If someone ever has, you know, another similar turntable to have a reference point. And do some Tannoy speakers. Uh, these were mostly, it looks like around the, the custom cabinet. Um, they do list the drivers here. I did a quick search. I couldn't really find these drivers, but I found similar ones. And they weren't as, I think, when I think of Tano, I tend to think the drivers are, you know, in the thousands and thousands of dollars each. And that is true for many of the earlier ones. Uh, we think of gold and the reds, you know, uh, those are the drivers that I tend to think about. But these are a little bit newer and they didn't, they didn't, they, these particular models don't seem to go for that high of a price. So I think the 712 that it, that it ended up closing for probably about the amount of the individual drivers, um, you know, separate from the cost of the cabinet. Hopefully they sound great and the person likes them and, uh, you know, they'll be, you know, well used over the years and they saved a ton of money by not having to build their own cabinets in this case. Well, there you go. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, it's not a topic that you get a chance to, uh, to showcase very often because there just aren't that many auctions or sales where you have that many great examples of custom built items. And so I thought it was a good opportunity to dive into this subject. Uh, there was a lot of gear there. 
um, lots of stuff. I didn't see anything that sold for more than I think it should have sold for. Um, there were some good buys, but most everything seemed to sell for about what I thought it should have went for, um, which makes me think that only people who are collectors who are or understand the market and how to price things, retail store of some sort um, that might use some of those pieces as sort of um, advertising in a way. And uh, there were no passion bidders. Someone, so it, sometimes you see, and this happens on eBay quite a bit, where someone feels like they have to have it. And you need two of those people because you need them to bid against each other. And if that happens, you, you don't know where the, where the top is. It can go for you know, prices that are unpredictable. And I didn't see anything like that in this case. So everyone that was bidding, I think, um, knew, the, knew the value and, and wasn't gonna go any higher than that. Um, so we might not see these pieces again. We may see them again, unfortunately, parted out. Uh, who knows? Um, who knows where they'll end up? Um, it'll be interesting if we see any of these pop back up on the market someday. But in um, any case, if you want to see another collection, check out the video I just did, uh, Julian Burke video, a collector extraordinaire, if you want to see some things that you probably won't see again, or at least a collection like that, uh, check out that video. Um, if you don't want to miss the next video, hit subscribe and do it now so you don't forget. Uh, and as always, you know, thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.